Okay, I think we can get started. Um, in the interest of time, we can get started right at, at four o'clock. So um, welcome everyone to our Grad Talks webinar on science. Um, we're really excited to have uh, an enriching conversation today about graduate school, particularly in, particularly in the science fields, um, and to provide some context on uh, how GMS funding works at the graduate level. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so just to start off with some introductions um, of us GMS APISF staff. Um, so you can put some faces with names. I know a lot of people, a lot of people are emailed by us. Um, so my name is Melissa May. I'm a program manager with GMS APISF. I've been on the team for about three years. We, Arianne, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Arianne Martin with uh, GMS APISF program manager. I've been with the organization almost three years and welcome and I know you're going to get a lot of great information. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leangelo Acuna. I am a program assistant here at GMS APISF. I've been here for almost two years now in like a few days. Um, and so my, my work anniversary is coming up. But um, Send me gifts, but either way, I'm really excited that um, we have all of you here today to talk about this really wide field of science and like what GMS scholars can really, you know, take advantage and like take away from this chat. So. And Colin D. Doshi is our campus engagement manager for the Northeast region. Uh, I'm not sure if she's going to be able to join us today, but um, just so that you guys are familiar with her as well. Okay, so just an overview of the day. Um, we have a representative from University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Sarah Patterson, is going to talk to us about uh, graduate programs in the science field. Um, and then we'll move on to looking at financial aid and GMS and understanding how your GMS funding works at the graduate level. Um, and then we will have some GMS scholar perspectives from our scholar panelists. Um, and then we'll end with some Q&A. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, you can feel free to type them into the chat. Uh, we can try to answer them um, as we're going in real time. Um, and if we don't get to them during the live presentation, then we'll uh, be sure to answer them by the end. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Sarah Patterson for everyone. Um, she currently serves as the Director of Science and Medicine. Uh, the Graduate Research Scholars Program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and is a professor in the Department of Horticulture. She has a broad background in plant biology and genetics with an additional, additional training in education. Her primary research focuses on understanding abscission in the model uh, plant, you know, might have to help me, Sarah. Arabidopsis. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and several crop plants. Um, Dr. Patterson laid the groundwork for basic research on cell cell adhesion and abscission by developing a screen for delayed abscission in Arapanthopsis. Thopsis, thank you, <laughs> and applying molecular, physiological, and morphological findings. Um, she recently expanded her research efforts to Mali, West Africa, to work on the orphan crop phonio. In addition, she spent a year with the National Science Foundation as a program director for the Plant Genome Program. And after obtaining her master's degree at Oregon State, um, she taught at a small four-year college and worked as a technician at the University of Pennsylvania. And she also worked in industry at Agricetus in Middleton, Wisconsin, before returning to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin to obtain a PhD in plant breeding and genetics. Um, she also teaches the introductory survey class for the horticulture department and several other seminar classes. So without further ado, um, Dr. Patterson, take it away. Okay, so now I think, how do I share again? Um, so if we stop sharing, if Leangela stops sharing, then you should be able to share on the bottom now. Okay, hold on. No, I don't see it, so wait a minute. Ugh. So let's see. If I go back to Zoom, I'm on Zoom. Okay. So now I'll go share. You'll see my messy screen. And then I'll go to my PowerPoint. So oh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. So I hope, let's see, is it going to work? Can you guys see it? Yes, we can see it now. 
Okay, so I hope this will be appropriate, interrupt me. I kind of did a little bit on crafting a competitive grad application. So I'll kind of go through it and stop me if you whatever need more. Um, so why graduate school? Is graduate school right for me? How do I prepare for, the, for graduate school? What program? How will I be able to pay? I'm not really going to address that. How do I apply? And what happens after graduate school? And just a little aside, SciMed um, GERS, SciMed Graduate Research Scholars, is a program at Wisconsin targeting minority underrepresented grad students in the biosciences. There are comparable programs in the, um, across campus in all colleges. Um, and this just happens to be the one I run. We have 150 scholars. We've been functioning for about 10 years. Um, and I'll tell you a little more. Okay, so why grad school? And I just quoted some of my students. Um, I applied to grad school with the objective that I could prepare myself for a broad range of upper level science industry jobs and give myself the opportunity for challenging positions throughout my career. I did not expect that working as a grad research assistant would teach me so much about lab management, the research process, and as a whole, as a whole in personal motivation. And then we have somebody else. Um, he wanted a PhD because of his specific interest in the field of skeletal muscle tissue and molecular events that occur in response to exercise. And then I think important, this student said, I wanted to be part of the next generation of scientists and continue carrying the torch from previous mentors. Another one, um, I'm, gra I'm in graduate school because I'm passionate about teaching. My students can't be what they can't see. So why grad school? You have a passion for science, for the research. Um, you want to develop further scientific excellence. You want to build connections between discovery and technological innovation, so enhanced learning. You want to contribute to the nation's future. So again, it's kind of almost, I want to, I want to continue forward. And you want to broaden participation, diversity, diversity and inclusiveness. Those would all Yeah, I think you might be frozen. Um, let's see. Mm. You guys can't hear Sarah, right? Okay. Oh, it happened. Let's see. Um, Oh, did she leave? Okay, maybe she'll rejoin. <laughs> okay, she's back. Okay, it just let me back in. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, okay, can you, it's sharing now, right? Not yet. Uh-oh. Um, let's see. Not yet? Oh, now it's starting to. Yep, now we're back. Okay, well, this quickly is just to show you that your earnings most likely will be much higher if you um, get a doctoral or professional degree. Even a master's degree will enhance your earnings, and it will also um, make getting a job easier. Um, okay, now, oh. Okay. Also, just showing you that even though if you look at initially when you come, when you join the job market, you'll get slightly higher salary with master's or doctorate or professional, but then your chances of increasing later as you um, have more experience and get older will significantly be higher if you have a doctorate or a professional degree. So I just kind of wanted to share those uh, points. Oops. So why go to grad school? You want to go into academia, education, you want to go into industry, you want to go into policy and government, 
Maybe you want to go into intellectual property, consulting, nonprofit. Truth be, um, a, grad, a grad degree will open many doors. I think I skipped a slide. No. Okay, so where are our graduates today? They go to academia. We've only been functioning 10 years. We have 11 faculty. We're quite proud of that. And they're all over the US. And then some of ours are now um, just research associates at other universities. Many have gone to industry and many have gone to nonprofit or government jobs. Um, and we even have some outliers that go to the World Bank um, and, and various other places. So the point is grad school doesn't close doors, it opens doors and you can go lots of directions. So again, as um, Dr. Maggie Washburn would say, why grad school? It's a way to embrace who you are. It can bring what you are to the table. Um, you can open doors, find the positive. You can practice your own creativity and you can build a bigger us. In other words, create more community. So these are her things. Don't go to grad school if you don't really want to. Um, what will I do in grad school? I just show these slides to kind of let everyone know, don't worry, grad school isn't all research. It's sharing, it's making connections. This is our student, she said, we work hard and we play hard. And I just show our community does lots of things, whether it's interacting with kids, interacting with faculty, even gardening, outreach, whatever. Um, this is one of my grad students. People often ask, how long will I be in grad school? I always tell my students, don't ask that. <laughs> it just depends on what you're doing. Um, you'll know when it's time to graduate. Um, is grad school right for me? So I always tell everyone, think about it. Think about the things you'll be doing um, as a grad student and make sure you're really ready. So when you ask that question, do I want to generate new knowledge? Do I have a passion for research? Do I want to share? Do I want to teach or publish? Um, these are really important things. Do I need more training? Am I mentally ready? Um, and do I want to go to grad school? Because it'll help me with additional career advancement. Those are all good reasons. But bad reasons? It's my plan B for professional school. In other words, I wanted to go to med school, but I'm going to go to grad school. Um, probably not a good, good reason. Um, I'm going to go to grad school because I'm going to please someone else. Just wait. Wait till you're really ready to go. I always say until you, you just, you, you, you taste it. You can't not go to grad school. Um, so you want to be passionate. Um, and don't go to grad school like why I did, which was, I just wanted to stay in school because I didn't know what else to do. Um, <laughs> no. So seriously, you should want to go. How do you prepare for grad school? Most of you have already done all this. You explore mentored research on your campus or summer research programs, internships. You need to do well in your classes, of course, but not stellar, stellar. You need to just do well enough. So above a 3.0 and you need to network at any opportunity. These are all good ways. So how do you explore and do the best when you do your research? Write your research up, present your research, any opportunity you have. Find mentors, not just one. It can be faculty, it can be postdocs, it can be other, you know, a grad student. Keep in touch with these mentors, even if you leave the institution. It'll serve you really well in the long run. Talk to the grad students in the lab you work in, talk to the postdocs, ask them about their experiences and identify your interests. Now that's really easily said in that I think, oh, I love doing cell molecular, but I don't know, do I want to work on plants, on xenopus, on cancer? It's okay if you don't know exactly what your interest is, just you want general interests. Okay, I said choose appropriate classes and do well. So no matter which science you go into, whether it's physical or biological, you want to make sure you have that cumulative GPA. If you have a class you did really poorly in, try to explain why when you have your letters that you write. Take different courses, think about what's important for where you're going, and get good grades in those important classes. GRE scores used to be very important. They're important in some fields, but others, not so much. University of Wisconsin, 
a string of schools are no longer even looking at them. But again, it just depends where you apply. I said network at any opportunity. This can be lots of ways. Outreach to the community, whether it's working with middle school kids, elementary, high schoolers. My students go and help um, high school students write college applications so they can go to college. Do webinars. Go to scientific conferences. And I'm sure many of you are familiar, but there are ones like Abercams, ERN, the Emerging Research Networks, Manners, SACNAS, and pictured on the right at the bottom is me uh, judging posters at the Emerging Research Networks conference. So what program do I want to go to? Now that can be challenging when you guys think about grad school. So identify your criteria. What am I interested? Um, do I just like basic biology? Do I not like working with animals? You know, things like that. Ask yourself, what's your criteria? Do I want to work with medical questions? Or no, no way. Am I more interested in the chemistry? So that's an important thing. Then identify a short list of schools, roughly 10 schools if you can. But how do you identify these schools? Talk to your mentors, talk to current graduate students, and consider multiple programs. So what program's right for me? This is just a snapshot of the programs at Wisconsin. This is overwhelming. Um, which program do I choose? So many schools have what they call uh, preview weekends in the fall before you apply to grad school. Those are great if you can get involved in one of those because then you get to kind of rotate through and see other programs. Oops. But if, if not, then there are a lot of umbrella programs. And so I highlighted here some of our umbrella. Cellular and molecular biology at Madison has 170 trainers in probably 30 different departments. So you're not choosing a department, you're choosing kind of, I wanna be a cellular molecular biologist. I don't know if I wanna work on RNA. I don't know if I wanna work on plants, but you have lots of options. So these are big umbrella programs and lots of college universities will have big umbrella programs. So how do you apply? Well, you got research experience, then you take the appropriate courses, you talk to your faculty and network. Those are all those good ways. Um, identify the criteria, the focus, attend these preview weekends, and then you have to write a personal statement and a research statement and letters. So I have lots of advice on your personal statement and your letters. Have all your recommenders review your personal statement, share it with them, and find faculty that's been on review panels for grants or for admitting grad students. And then if you can, have some grad students at your university share their personal statements that they wrote before they applied to grad school. And you'll find they're all really different. Same thing goes with your research statement. Let your faculty review these. Um, try to find faculty that have been this. But you write your research statement for a general science audience. Don't get caught up in too many details. Kind of remember it's, it's going to be a little broader. And mention specifically how that graduate program you're applying to meets your interests. So I always say you're going to tailor each research statement for the schools you're applying to. Don't just write one fits all. You, but it's not that hard to tweak them. So when um, you get Dr. Letters, Patterson, just really quickly, um, we have a question in the chat that's specifically okay. about personal statements. So I just wanted to jump in while we're on the topic. Okay. Um, so the student said, should I spend some space in my personal statement to actually explain my low GPA or use that precious space to focus more on my strength and let the committee decide on the app as a whole uh, on their own? I would recommend doing both and explain why you think you have a low GPA. We like explanations. In fact, your letter recommenders can also address it and say this student's GPA does not reflect their abilities. That's a great statement. Um, so discuss it with people that write your letters as well. Often I write a letter for a student and, and I'm shocked how low their GPA is because I had no idea. So don't be afraid to address it. If you have anything uniquely personal, it's great in the personal statement. Particularly if you're applying for um, 
like National Science Foundation grants or things like that, they like the personal statement. Share your experiences on how you want to progress after grad school as well. Like I want to share with future generations. I want to continue outreach to my community. Things like that are good to include. So back to letters of recommendation. Talk to each person you write, you ask to write letters. Be organized. Provide drafts of your statement to your recommenders. Provide a list of your recommenders as needed. And then I put in there, be true to yourself and be inspired. So again, when you're writing those personal statements and those research statements, um, yeah, try to, try to be true to yourself. How will you pay? So I'm going to let this go on later, but there are stipends that almost any good quality grad program will provide, and then there are fellowships. And schools like Wisconsin and many others, they won't accept you into a grad program unless they're going to pay you. So it's kind of something to step back and think about. That's particularly true of the biosciences. Some of the physical sciences are a little more challenging and they'll make you do teaching assistantships. Um, and then there are many, many different fellowships um, that one can apply to. Um, so yeah, those are just kind of little heads up. And um, I just put a little extra on additional funding. The NSF Graduate Fellowship Program is a great one. Um, it's called the GRFP and apply early to grad schools because you might be eligible for university fellowships. And don't get discouraged if you feel like you're not quite ready. Think about a post-bac or a prep program. These are great programs and many schools around the U.S. do that. And I'm going to end there. This is just our latest cohort that came to Wisconsin. Um, and I think I just lost. <laughs> Did you lose me again? Oops. Just the slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I think I'm good. Now, how do I get, I'll stop share. So are there more questions? I went a little over, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah, let's look at um, some of the questions from before. Uh, let me scroll up. Um, Um, okay, so uh, some schools eliminated the GRE and probably other components of the application will be more heavily evaluated. My GPA is a 3.39 out of 4 from Duke for undergrad and currently doing a master's in science in Europe with multiple publications. How should I better position myself for a PhD program? So I would say you're already very well positioned, <laughs> um, but the best things you can do is talk to your letter writers and, and make sure they're happy about writing a strong letter. And I would argue letter writers from multiple institutions, one from your Duke experience, one from your European experience, um, by having different schools um, weigh in, that's to your advantage. Um, different schools have different reputations and so again like coming from Duke that's going to be a strong everyone knows Duke no problem um, yeah I will argue many schools don't need the GREs anymore you're gonna have to look school to school um, and then most PhDs are fully funded uh, so what contribution do other funding awards like the National Science Foundation um, GRFP, PD, Soros, etc. Um, is there sources of all of these fundings? So the advantage of getting fellowships is it gives you more flexibility in what lab you can go to. Sometimes a lab might only have three years of funding. If you come in with an extra two years, now you can go to more, more choices. Um, they're also an honor and what will help, they will help you further down your career. Um, getting one grant kind of makes you get more grants later. Um, often the um, National Science Foundation will pay at a slightly higher rate than a grad stipend. They might give you a travel budget as well. So they're all pluses and, and it just gives you an extra, yeah, opportunities. 
Um, and then I think maybe the last question is, what are the pros uh, versus the cons of doing a PhD funded in industry and by traditional institutions? So I think that when you do a PhD funded by industry, and it depends, I'm a plant scientist and we have PhDs funded by Monsanto, it will narrow what that grad student can do research-wise it narrows their publications. They have to be approved by the company first. And then they're committed. Sometimes their strings. They have to go work for the company for a couple, couple years. Um, that would be a downside. The advantages, you probably could, again, like a fellowship, go in and work for more different PIs or investigators. And I, I put on my CV that I had done industry as well as government, as well as academia and big R1 university and small college, just because I wanted you to understand. If you have questions, you can email me and ask about the different approaches. Perfect. Um, and if we could, we just have one more question that popped up in the chat. Um, should I contact the professors or program director before applying to the PhD programs at a particular school? And will this come out as overdoing it? Or what questions uh, should I think about? Um, or should what question about asking them to assess a PhD program? What should I think about in asking to assess a PhD program? Sorry. So I would argue, in general, it doesn't hurt to contact in advance, especially if you're going to be in the region. You can say, I'm, I'm going to be nearby. I like to stop in or or even just a conversation. Um, one might want to think carefully before they ask too many questions. If it's right there on the website, you don't want to ask questions that are up in front because um, then that doesn't make you look quite as, as good. But I always say even after an interview, contacting the university you just interviewed with is always to your advantage. The professors you spoke to, it's, it's good. It shouldn't hurt. Anymore. <laughs> um, I think that's it for now. Um, there is one more question, but I might have that student um, email you if, if that's okay. Um, yeah. yeah, so we'll share um, an email address um, so that we can keep conversations going. Um, okay. But thank you so much, Dr. Patterson. Um, and good luck, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> we have a couple Gates scholars here. We're, oh. We've had a couple. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, all right. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and should I should I um, log out? Um, it's up to you. You can stay on for the rest of the time if there's questions at the end, um, or if you have you know other obligations, you can feel free to jump off. I'll just mute it, and then if you have questions for me, go ahead and let me know. Perfect. Sure. Okay. Um, then, Leandro, do you want to share? Yep. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so next we have um, Colony Doshi. Uh, she's our Campus Engagement Manager for the Northeast Region with GMS API ASF. She's going to talk a little bit about how your GMS scholarship works at the graduate level. Hi all, this, um, thank you so much for that intro, Melissa. Um, I'm super excited to talk to you about uh, how the graduate funding works up, uh, specifically for the Gates Millennium Scholars Program on the graduate level and more specifically with folks majoring in sciences. So um, first off, uh, there is a cap, unlike your undergraduate funding, there is a cap around, um, around your graduate funding and that cap uh, currently is about 48,000 on the pub private institution and 40,000 um, a little north of 40,000 on the public institution. With that being said, I do want to highlight that with public institutions, if you are planning to attend an institution that is classified as a public institution and you are not a resident of that institution, you are still capped at $40,000. Um, a little north of $40,000. What that means is um, it is per year. Great question, Alex, and hi, Alex. Um, it's per year. So, uh, so what that means is um, I'm a student from, uh, let's say, uh, Virginia, and I want to attend Rutgers University, which is a public institution for my graduate studies. 
uh, my cap will be $40,000, uh, even though I may have to pay out-of-state tuition. Um, now, with that being said, we encourage students to take on opportunities in research opportunities, um, graduate assistant opp opportunities, and administrative uh, um, assistantship opportunities. The reason we say that is because we, it, one, it does alleviate the gap that the cap of the GMS funding has with your institution, but what it does, um, it also builds your, builds your resume to then build upon your opportunities to get jobs either in industry or apply to PhDs. Um, what that means is, and how GMS calculates that, is let's say a cost of attending an institution is about $50,000. You get a graduate assistantship that pays about $20,000. Um, and what that $20,000 uh, either is going to you directly or is paying for your tuition. Um, and then there's a gap of $30,000. GMS will pay that $30,000. Now, remember I said that depending on which group that you are, public institution or private institution, you have a cap of $40,000 or $48,000. So your leftover in this example, you're left over with $10,000 or $18,000. That $10,000 or $18,000 can go to summer funding. Um, this is extremely important and extremely different from what undergraduate uh, undergraduate experience was for GMS. Um, the reason that this, this is different is because we want, we are encouraging students to uh, take advantage of summer opportunities, especially if ha they have leftover funds from the academic year. Um, I'm going to pause right there. Melissa, is there, I, I can't see the chat. Um, it, it, are there any questions that you can voice over? Yeah, so looking at what's included in your cost of attendance, um, and then kind of what's, uh, what are kind of the funding breakdowns? So what's included in the, the graduate cap? So it's exactly like the undergraduate. Um, so you, you know how GMS uh, with undergraduate covers your tuition and then your cost of living. It's exact, we, GMS does exactly the same way of calculating for graduate school. It's just that there is a cap to that. Is that clear? I'm not sure if that's clear. If you'd like to jump in, Melissa, that'd be great. <laughs> no, yeah, I think you're right. Um, yeah, so if you, you know, for example, go to school in New York City, then your, um, your, tu your graduate cap might only cover your tuition, and then your cost for housing or personal expenses or transportation might be what you have to make up with that graduate assistantship or teaching assistantship or the extra funding. Um, and I think Dr. Patterson did a great job outlining all, all the different um, additional sources of funding where students can find um, some opportunities. Um, we have another question that popped up um, in the chat. Would the NIH be considered as an eligible institution because there is a PhD program that is a partner with the NHS and a U.S. grad school, NIH and U.S. grad school? So that's a great question. Um, it, it really depends on if this, the U.S. grad school is in a, an accredited inst uh, university here in the United States. So um, what I would recommend is filling out, uh, Melissa, did you go over graduate program inquiry forms? No, nope, not yet. Okay, perfect segue. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, the, what we, I would encourage you to do is to fill a graduate program inquiry form, and that allows you to understand of like, hey, is this program fundable or not? Um, I recommend doing that. You can do it alongside your applications when you're applying to graduate school, or um, I would recommend doing it before you're at the table and making your decision of like, hey, I'm going to enroll into this grad school or not. So you can do it alongside your uh, graduate school applications or do it prior to that. Um, and we have a deadline of March 1st, but, um, but you know, of course, there's extenuating circumstances, we'll of course review that information. Um, and what we take into consideration is, does your program align with the GMS guidelines? I, before you submit your graduate program inquiry form, take a look at the graduate, uh, at the GMS guidelines to see if your program is fundable. Any other questions, Melissa? I think that's it. Great.
Thank you. Thanks, Kalindi. Great. Cool. So now we will move over into our student panel, scholar panel. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, now we're going to take the time to hear from our amazing lineup of scholars who have agreed to you know, talk to everyone here today, um, all in the science field and all doctoral students, which is so fancy. I could never even comprehend, um, for me at least. So um, yeah, so first up, we have Hillary Yu, and she is currently a third year PhD student in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley. Her research interests um, include the development of energy resources associated with environmental impacts. Um, in the year before graduate school, she spent some time pursuing another passion, working on a death penalty sentence rehearing re project in M M Malawi. Um, Hillary graduated in 2015 from Cornell University, where she majored in both government and biological sciences with a concentration in ecology and evolutionary biology in the latter. Um, and then we have James Ousey. Um, he is a GMS scholar from the class of 2012. He attended Stanford University for his BS in chemical engineering and conducted undergraduate lab research in biochemistry. Uh, during the summer terms, he performed work study at the campus hospital and completed industry internships in oil and gas slash pharma. And after graduating, he left his master's program to work as a research technician in a genetics lab at Stanford before starting at Caltech in late 2017 in the biochemistry PhD track. And then we have Angela Van. Um, she completed her undergraduate work at UC Berkeley in molecular toxicology and molecular environmental biology. Um, she is currently a fifth year doctoral student in the biomedical sciences and graduate program at UC San Diego. Um, under the guidance of her advisor, Dr. Alexandra Newton, um, Angela is currently investigating the role of protein kinase C, PKC fusion proteins in cancer. Um, she is part of the 2008 cohort of the GMS program and has been active being president and a campus space leader for the Berkeley GMS Association and sits on the San Diego GMS Alumni Association board. And then finally, we have Johnny Wynn. Um, he is a rising third year um, at Vanderbilt University pursuing a PhD in organic chemistry and works as a graduate research assistant. Prior to enrolling at Vanderbilt University, Johnny completed his undergraduate degree at UC Riverside, where he received a Bachelor of Science in chemical engineering along with a minor in chemistry. Johnny aspires to provide resources and skills for students to be successful in school and careers in the STEM fields. And so with that, um, I'm going to shift into the first question. Um, any of our scholars, feel free to jump in. Um, so for this, for this field, the science field, like what motivated you to pursue a graduate degree um, in, this, um, in the programs that you're in? Um, what sort of motivated you to do that? I don't know if we're going in any order, but I guess I'll start. Um, thanks, Leangelo and GMS for hosting this. Um, well, to answer your question, I, as an undergraduate, I studied government and ecology. I was mostly interested in kind of the impacts of civilization and human development on the environment. Um, I was actually considering going to law school for environmental law, but as you mentioned, I was in Malawi for a year. Um, and when I was there, before leaving, I actually applied to a couple of graduate schools, um, thinking about that as an opportunity as well. Um, but when I was in Malawi, it opened my eyes to a lot of the kind of energy and resource access issues that are so predominant in many parts of the world. Um, and that experience inspired me to go to graduate school in the current program that I'm in at UC Berkeley um, to kind of explore not only how just environmental impacts and what um, those mean for the world we live in, but also to see how we can expand access and meet fundamental needs in an environmental, environmentally sustainable manner. So, um, yeah, and so I'm really excited now to be in my third year. Um, so I guess I can go. Um, thank you, GMS and APS, for um, hosting this wonderful event. Um, so I guess for me, um, I started getting really interested in applying for. Um, graduate school or just like even doing research um, the first after my first semester of my freshman year in undergrad um, I had a TA that was like very you know energetic about the sciences and then from there on he kind of like you know introduced me to 
his professor and then I ended up working for him as an undergraduate student and staying in the lab for a good four years. Um, and from there, um, um, even though my undergrad major is in chemical engineering, um, a lot of the research that I did was on organic synthesis. So just seeing how molecules and drugs and stuff are able to help uh, treat various infectious diseases or uh, the process of like drug discovery has always been a very interest for me. So from there on, um, I wasn't sure if I was ready for graduate school. So I um, took some time off to you know travel abroad where I visited um, like two or three different continents, like in Africa, seeing how HIV is um, a major problem as well as um, in South America, looking at um, the Chagas disease and different um, medical issues that were going on. And that kind of like motivated me to, you know, kind of see all the um, issues that individuals that are facing around the world, not just within um, the United States. So from there on, just wanting to um, use what I know as um, all the classes and the, um, I guess, hands-on work that I've had as an undergraduate researcher, um, that kind of like motivated me to pursue graduate um, school. But also like um, one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of in higher education, you don't really see a lot of like Asian American or first generation faculty members. So that kind of really motivated me to pursue my PhD and someday um, join um, the faculties and um, enabling students to see that there's um, students that look like them and um, that could do it too in a way. So that's kind of what got me into pursuing graduate education, but um, like, and onwards, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. I, I hope you can hear me all right. Uh, mm -hmm. We were having some troubles with the microphone earlier. Um, so, yeah, yeah, you heard. Uh, I have actually a, a similar story to Johnny. Um, we both studied chemical engineering, and we found that uh, we fell in love with the research we did in the lab and pursued that in grad school. Um, I, I think one distinction I might have from Johnny's story is that I, I actually had very little interest in attending grad school until very late in my undergrad career. I had every intention of becoming an engineer. Um, so what I did during the summers was try internships, en engineering internships to see how, how I liked it. And I found that I, I didn't really enjoy it that much. So what I did was I emailed one of my PIs who I had a lot of respect for. And uh, he said, you know, James, you seem like you're struggling, struggling a little bit. Uh, why don't you see what lab research is like? You know, you seem excited about the class and this is why we have such a good, good relationship. So I tried the research in his group and I found that I really enjoyed it. And uh, I started considering graduate school as a, a potential option, but I wasn't fully set on it. So what I did after I graduated was I found a position as a research technician um, where you do uh, very similar, it's a very similar day to day to what the grad students do, except you don't take classes. And I, I pursued that for about a year and decided that, okay, um, you seem like you like the schedule, you're interested in performing lab research, why don't you consider graduate school? And I applied for PhD programs. So, hi everyone, my name's Angela. And I guess my story is more similar to Hillary's where I was initially interested in professional school. I was actually interested in going to pharmacy school. Um, but with the opportunity that GMS provides, I wanted to consider graduate school and doing a PhD program is all about conducting research. So I wanted to start working in a laboratory at Berkeley and figure out if that's what I wanted or not. And when I started working, I had an amazing uh, mentor and I really found that I enjoyed bench work and that got me interested in actually pursuing research as a career. Um, and I guess I thought about it a little bit more practically. What did I want to do in the long term, which was enter industry as a research scientist? And besides salary, which was pointed out by Sarah, uh, there's also a certain level of autonomy afforded to PhDs that are not necessarily given to masters or undergraduates um, straight out of graduating. And so practically speaking, I really needed to do this PhD in order to reach my long-term career goal. Thank you, everyone. Um, and so with that, um, it sounds like, you know, these PhD programs are a lot of work and it's very rigorous, right? So, I mean, 
and in STEM, no less, right? So what are some of your strategies for success um, in these fields and in these graduate programs, considering like all the things that you have to juggle and all the things you have to, you know, balance in your um, academic careers? Uh, I, I can I can go ahead and start if that's all right with the other scholars. Um, well, you know, if, if you're at the position where you're considering whether or not you want to pursue grad school right now, you know, as an undergrad or someone who's recently graduated, um, I, I suppose the best thing you could do is to see what it's like if you have that opportunity. So if you're an undergrad and you're interested in grad school, but you haven't necessarily seen what it's like to work in a lab, that should be your top priority is to find a professor uh, you, you have a good relationship with or, you know, reach out to a lab whose research you've, you know, uh, read about on their website that seems interesting to you and see if you can find a position either shadowing a grad student or even maybe a, sm a small project on your own. But it, if you haven't had the experience of working in a lab, I would definitely make that your top priority. Um, as far as a strategy for success in uh, you know, grad school, once you're in it or once you're working as a technician in a research lab. Um, you know, I, I think finding a good boss or making sure that uh, the PI you work for um, is someone who you get along with, who has respect for you and, you, um, you know, make sure the respect is mutual is probably one of the most important things you can do. Um, you hear a lot of very terrible stories of people who either don't get along with their PI or who have you know, clashes or, or differing opinions that um, end up uh, you know, far more negative than a PhD experience should be. I mean, it's already harrowing enough, you know? So to top it off with a poor boss or a poor working relationship with other students in the lab um, can make it even worse. And uh, to, to try to answer the question of whether or not your PI is a good fit, you can always you know, ask the graduate students in that lab, either when you're interviewing or when you're doing your rotations um, and try to get a one-on-one -on -one meeting to see if they, uh, they're a good fit for you. Like I was interested in a, a particular lab at UC Berkeley and um, during the interview process I found that the graduate students had a lot of poor things to say about the PI and I also got a negative impression from the interview. So even though the research was very interesting, I found myself leaning towards a different institution precisely because of that personal interaction. So I guess I'll um, kind of bounce on uh, what uh, James previously said. Um, so I would say like um, being very, in order to be successful in graduate school, I would say one of the main thing is um, making sure um, that you know you have support from friends and family because that could go a long way. Um, especially during, um, you know, having your preliminary exams and, or like preparing for your qualifying exams and so forth. And just having someone to talk to or someone that's supportive or, uh, or there for you um, is one of the most important things that I would say for me. But also like another thing is um, your relationship with your advisor um, is probably going to make or break your graduate career. If you have an advisor that's like very supportive and really understands you, um, then that could go a long way because um, their network is going to help you, you know, get into postdoc positions or even like industry or um, different career options later on. And I guess for me, um, it's just making sure that um, you're constantly, um, you know, you're focused on what you're doing, that you're loving what you're doing, you're passionate about it, but also making sure that you have time for yourself and uh, personal space for you to not only grow as a scientist, but also as growing as a, a person outside of school. Um, so that's um, some of the things that I've been working on. And I find that a lot of the older students in my lab um, have um, shared similar um, things and what helps them get through their graduate education. I would also, I think, emphasize some of the same things that James and Johnny mentioned, especially about um, getting the opportunity to talk with existing graduate students, um, either before deciding on what program to apply to or after you've 
been accepted and you're going uh, to the university for a visit day, um, it, that relationship with your PI is quite crucial. Um, and, you know, of course, there are also tools if you need to somehow, when you're in grad school, um, address that relationship. It's not, but it's always good to, I think, invest in that a little bit before deciding on what program to go into. Um, I'd also say, this isn't, I guess, how to get through grad school, but I would uh, advise taking the opportunity to kind of not just stick to, I mean, certainly deepen uh, your skills and the topics that you're interested in, but I think what's really great about graduate school is also you get the chance to kind of take classes that maybe you didn't have the chance to as an undergraduate. And when you're in grad school, I think the, you know, the process is a little bit more about discovery and interest um, rather than, I think, the pressures that often uh, eclipse kind of at the undergraduate level. So I would just say take the opportunity if you go to grad school to maybe explore a few new classes um, that you hadn't thought about but maybe are interested in. Okay. Uh, well, I have uh, three things, I guess, that I would say when you're in graduate school to help you succeed, I guess. Uh, the first thing is not to put all your eggs in one basket. And this uh, has a lot to do with what you're working on in terms of your projects. You know, a lot of the time I see people working on one project and having that one project define whether you succeed or fail is a lot of pressure to put on yourself. And a lot of times that primary project that you start out working on isn't what you end up doing for your thesis, which is what happened to me. So just having multiple projects in the beginning and seeing what works out is a great strategy to ensure that you'll have something at the end that will be fulfilling for you and that will have results. Uh, the second thing is to always be an advocate for yourself. So yes, you want to have a PI that basically has your support, that supports you and wants your success. But you know, your PI also has lots of um, other interests that they have to juggle. Um, and so you always want to ensure that your well-being is put first, at least for you. Because sometimes when they're, you're in a lab environment, there, there, there are a lot of people there um, you need to speak up if you want a certain opportunity or if you want to take a certain path. Um, so it's good just to remember that you have power in yourself to ensure your success and that you don't have to um, be a follower, basically. And then the last thing I would say, which is the toughest lesson to learn, and I'm still trying to deal with it today, is learning to accept failure and not taking that personally. Because, you know, like Leangelo said, doing a PhD program is a very long you know, five to seven years sometimes process, and it's very challenging. Um, and there's going to be failure that's inevitable when you're doing science. Some leads just don't turn out. And so what keeps you going is learning to accept that failure and then just keep persisting. So you need some resilience there. And I think it's a growing pain that everyone goes through in the beginning, um, but just learn that that failure doesn't define you. So the less personally that you take it, um, the better you'll be in the long run because I, the PhD is really a marathon and not a sprint. So those are my advice. All right, awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing all those tips and tricks. You know, just takeaways considering, again, like the rigor and the harrowingness, harrowingness of the PhD programs. Um, and just like last, a lot, one last question. Um, very briefly so we can still um, open it up to any scholars who have any other questions, but um, what are your like long-term career and academic goals? I know, Angela, you mentioned like industry. Um, I'm not sure like what it looks like for the rest of you exactly, but if you want to like touch on that briefly, just to, you know, um, give everyone an idea. Um, so I guess I can go first um, this time. So for me, uh, I kind of want to, um, in a way, combine what I learned in my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering. And I kind of realized that for me, um, as a synthetic chemist, um, you can do process chemistry. And that's where chemists and engineers kind of go hand in hand. So I kind of see it as um, something that will really make me marketable as a um, applicant for jobs later on because I'm able to understand the engineering side of things as well as uh, um, synthetic strategies and your chemistry that it takes to develop drugs or compounds. Um, but for me, uh, what I would love to do is to um, go in industry, work for about you know, 10 or 15 years, um, 
to see how drug developments in that sector is like, but eventually go back and um, teach at a uh, public university in hopes of um, giving students opportunities to know how it's like doing research in an academic setting as well as research in an industrial setting. So having faculty members that have both sides of those um, experiences um, is very beneficial for students and I was very um, happy that I had a faculty member in undergraduate um, that had both sides of things. So he opened doors for me in terms of getting industry internships as well as um, doing REUs at different universities in the summer. So uh, long term, I want to be in uh, academia as well as, um, you know, being a community leader on campus and so forth. So if I'm allowed to speak out, um, I thought I'd just reiterate a couple things that you guys have been talking about. Um, I don't want you to keep emphasizing how bad it is. Grad school actually can be so rewarding and fun and although stressful at times, don't worry. Lots of schools have programs that will help support you. We give um, a seminar that really helps you choose a lab, how to find multiple mentors, how to manage your time, what are lab expectations. So when you look at programs, when you look places, look for those kinds of support because those can really make your um, community better. And the support that you guys have talked about is so important. Peers, friends, family, all of that will help you. And um, the last thing I wanted to say, will the take care of yourself? Yes. You want sleep, you want exercise, but obviously you're going to need to work. And, and as Angela said, to be an advocate for yourself, um, accept failure and, and have the new term they go by is have a lot of grit. <laughs> but at any rate, I, I just want to say, enjoy it. it. It shouldn't be harrowing. It shouldn't be bad. It's stressful, it's long, but you're getting paid to go to school and, and you're going to go forward and you're doing it because it's your passion. Sorry, just couldn't help but interjecting a little bit there. Yeah. No, yeah, definitely. Thanks. I mean, um, for sure, like it is stressful, but right, you, this is your passion. This is like, you are working towards something that you really care about and really like, you're investing your entire lives in. So, um, oh yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, did anyone else want to jump in about the career piece or did or we can turn to um, questions coming from any scholars well I, I can share my my goals and it's uh, it's pretty straightforward I, I'm in the PhD program and I um, would like one day to have a lab of my own um, and uh, pursue research with a team on topics I'm interested in uh, that would be that would be my dream, um, but of course the short-term goals are to graduate in a reasonable time frame, and uh, use what I've learned in graduate school to uh, get a nice postdoc position, because um, it seems to be necessary now <laughs> for uh, for the types of positions I want. I, yeah, I, I'll just hop in there as well and say, um, I think what you discover in grad school is kind of that love of discovery. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I think it's, um, I also, a goal of mine is to, I think, go into academia that really enables you to keep discovering um, throughout the rest of your life. Okay, um, so it's, um, I think it's right about five, so you know, if anyone has to, yeah, we also have two questions in the chat, um, but I wanted to give Angela an opportunity to answer that last question, just in case there was anything um, that we missed there. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in industry. I think I knew from the beginning that I didn't want to pursue academia as my end goal. Um, I really enjoy bench work, and that I also enjoy research related to diseases. And so I think a biotech company was something that 
I really wanted to work in in the future because, you know, they have certain endpoints that are they're going to meet. And I think in academia, there's a different sort of vibe there. Not any, I mean, not that one is better than the other. It's just that, you know, really in academia, you're discovering things sometimes just for the love of discovering things. And in biotech, it's more, you know, we want an endpoint. And so that was more the research that I wanted to do. Um, also going into academia and having your lab, uh, that's not something that I was super interested in. And I, you know, that's a very noble profession, of course. Um, but I guess I wasn't really interested in pursuing that. And luckily for me, you know, I think a lot of professors are coming to the realization that, you know, they're not, it's not feasible for everyone to go into academia. And so now they're starting to show more support for these alternative careers, which are becoming more the norm. And so my program um, offers an internship program where I can go work at biotech for two months or something like that so that I can get that experience. So also going after those opportunities, if that's what you want to do later on, um, it's good to do during graduate school. Great, thanks. Um, so just to pose a question from the chat um, to anyone who uh, is willing to answer, um, besides the research, are there other factors we need to pay attention to in preparing for the next step after, like a postdoc job, et cetera? I guess I can um, answer that because I'm in the process of that right now. Um, so a lot of days now, um, I guess nowadays in a lot of um, higher um, different academic groups, there's usually like a wait list for postdoc positions. So that could be from um, students from in international university from like China or from the UK and so forth that are applying for the same position that you're applying for. So my PI usually um, at the end of my, your third year or beginning of your fourth year, that's when he start making contacts to um, some of his network to um, in a way, sell his students to the other faculties, like, hey, this is my student, this is what his project on, this is what experiences he has, um, to try to get that student on the wait list. Because a lot of times nowadays, it's really hard to get a postdoc if you don't have your um, external funding, like your um, like NIH, NIH um, postdoc funding, as well as like, you know, getting industry postdoc funding as well, too. So, a lot of times, um, faculties at different university, they will have to take out money from their grant to pay for their postdocs. But if, most of the time, if you're able to get um, funding for postdoc positions, um, you have a greater chance of getting a position later on. But also, um, talking early with your PI about what type of area of research that you're interested in or the type of work that other people are working on, most of the time, he could, uh, you know, already poached other faculties about the idea of, you know, having you as a potential um, postdoc candidate for their lab. But um, nowadays, I guess my PI, um, you know, we, we have a recent conversation about this, but it takes about one or two years of getting into like um, postdocs, depending on like um, how big the name of that uh, PI or that advisor they're, they're at. Like, so um, having an early idea and talking to your advisor is really important because they can start um, start to talk with other people for that for postdocs. Well, um, and then another question we had um, is for Johnny. Um, what, uh, what was it like transitioning between subjects as your area of focus? Um, even though chemical engineering and organic chemistry is slightly related, did you find it hard to immerse yourself into organic the organic chemistry program? Um, so we'll start with that. And then there's also a question for James and then for everyone. Um, so I guess for me, um, so um, I have around like four or five years of undergraduate research experience um, not at UC Riverside, but also at UC Berkeley. So projects I worked on was mostly um, synthesis work. So building and creating molecules. Um, so for me, I, even though I took my chemical engineering classes, I also took um, um, major core classes in chemistry, but also took um, graduate level chemistry classes as an undergrad. Um, so that kind of really helped me prepare for what I was going to. But um, I would say one of the biggest thing um, that a lot of um, advisors look at is your research experience. And that could go a long way. Um, and um, I know GPA is important in, in all, um, but as long as you meet the GPA requirement, um, 
one of the major things that um, I guess faculties look at is publication and research experience. So that's something um, that's really important, but um, it wasn't that much of a big transition for me right now. I would say the biggest transition for me is um, slowly getting into the biology of the chemistry that I'm working on. Um, so engineering, that's a lot of math and a lot of uh, physics, but organic synthesis or organic chemistry is making molecules and seeing how it works in a biological system. So understanding the biology for me um, is slowly um, getting really difficult in, in terms of like immersing myself, but uh, my program is a very interdisciplinary program. So you get a little bit of everything for your core classes for graduate school. So um, like my faculty advisor is very supportive in whatever that I'm interested in. And especially I'm um, being a Gates scholar and having external funding. Um, my advisor let me do work on projects that I'm interested in, not technically I'm forced to work on a project that's funded by his grant, but I have more of like, um, autonomy in terms of what I want to work on. So being a Gates Scholar was a plus in that sense for me too. Cool. Um, then the next question we have is, have is for James. Um, what made you go straight into your PhD instead of pursuing a master's degree first? Hi. Um, yeah, so at, at the time, you know, there were a couple factors that, that I was considering. Um, I think some specifics about the situation are a little necessary. So in chemical engineering, at least in my experience and with the people I discussed, um, a, a master's degree does not help that much in terms of how much it can advance your career beyond the baseline. And uh, specifically about the master's degree that I was pursuing at the time, all it would have been would be uh, nine months of extra coursework that would be added on to my bachelor's. Um, so it wasn't a research master's degree. I didn't have any uh, exposure to lab work had I had I wanted to pursue the master's so um, you know at the time if you're, you're considering okay you know I want a, a pathway uh, to a PhD and I kind of want to see what it's like and I, I want what I do now to um, you know inform my decision in the future I decided to drop the nine months of coursework uh, which the master's degree would have entailed in favor of pursuing something that I think would um, would you know make me a better candidate for grad school and kind of show me what it's like. So I decided to become a research technician during that year. And you know, be becoming a research technician is a it, it's, it sounds easier than it is, right? You do have to apply at a whole bunch of places and then interview and then hopefully get offered a position. Um, but I, I decided to apply for those types of positions instead, and it really helped out because one, I got a lot of lab experience and I actually got a neat publication out of it. Uh, so overall, it was a good choice because I was interested in going to grad school or because I was thinking I might have been interested in going to grad school. Um, so that was the decision to drop out of the master's degree. Um, I want to be mindful of time. I know that everyone is incredibly busy, so I just want to, you know, give the option if, um, if you do need to drop off, um, that's totally fine. But I also think that this conversation has been very enriching and really helpful. So if you're able to stay on, um, that's great. If you need to drop off, totally understand. Um, but we just have a few more questions um, in the chat if folks are able to, to hang on. Um, so the first one is, since GMS only funds you for three or four years of your PhD, uh, how, would you fund, how did you fund your education after that? Is it applying for fellowships or was it something else? So I would say that this is really dependent on your program because, you know, even programs within the same field are very, very different. Uh, so I'm in biomedical sciences and I would say that fortunate for us, we tend to have a lot of funding. And so my program specifically, once you join the program, they have to pay for you for, for the duration of your studies. So really everyone in our program gets paid the same amount of money. Uh, so in that case, you can't get more than what the, the, the level that they set, um, but you won't get less either. So for better or for worse, that's what you're going to get paid at. Um, GMS is great because, you know, they give you money for your your graduate school and in that case I would still I still get GMS funding it's just that my PI specifically doesn't have to pay that but whatever difference there is from what GMS pays me and then that level that they set uh, my PI is required to pay for that 
Um, in terms of other, other things you could do, um, applying for fellowships is a great idea. You know, there are non-monetary benefits to earning these fellowships. It looks great on your CV or resume. Um, there are a lot of networking opportunities that they provide you in addition to, you know, giving you that stipend. So applying for fellowships is just a good idea in general, and it gets you in the habit of how to of grant writing, really. If academia is your passion in the future, then this is your way of starting out um, testing your grant writing skills. And so, yeah, that's, I would say that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, other programs, they might t ask you to TA more so that you can get that money to fund yourself. And then some places, they don't offer you money at all, and you just have to kind of figure it out. So it, I would say it depends on the specific program and department and everything. You know, this is kind of a, a bold statement to make, but like, if you're a science PhD program, like any program worth its salt will have some way to make sure that you as a graduate student are, are being funded somehow. So like, it, it, yeah, they might ask you to TA more or, or something like that, or do some side you know, admin work. But really, if you're considering applying to grad school, the concern should not really be you know, how am I going to get this paid for? Usually, the, the program will have some way of you know, paying you for it. I have only heard very, very horrible stories of PIs who say, okay, I'm going to cut your funding after um, four years because you're not pumping out the research I want to see or like your progress isn't very good. And those are few and far between and are not professional at all. So really, you know, because even though GMS funds well, only four years, that's four years that the program doesn't have to, have to pay for you. But Really, the, the expectation is that you're going to be paid for regardless. Yeah, and I also just want to uh, plug the option of doctoral deferment that GMS offers. So if you know you get full funding um, in, in the first uh, year of your PhD program, you can defer your GMS funding to use later on. So you know, if it's uh, while you're writing a dissertation um, or something afterwards, uh, you can defer that GMS funding to use later on in your PhD as well. Um. Oh, something I just want to add in real quick is, um, so, af so as a PhD student, you're a bit more pricier um, when you first, your first couple years of grad school, but after your qualifying exam, when you become a candidate, um, you're not that expensive um, as a student to um, pay for. So usually um, by that time, your advisor would probably pay for your just teeing, but um, you shouldn't ever really worry about not having enough money in such um, in STEM PhD programs because there's always money flowing around. Um, if you have to TA or if you tutor or however it may be, um, there's always funding for you. So that's something that um, you shouldn't really worry too much about. So I just wanted to chime in with the funding. Again, it, like they're saying, it shouldn't be an issue. It is cheaper after you're a dissertator. So if you have Gates GMS funding and you do want to defer, the advantage is that tuition remission is going to be a lower cost. And so your money might go further. I don't know. But yeah, I'm going to leave because I have another meeting I have to lead. Okay, and good luck Great. and feel free to, yeah, contact me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. We appreciate it. Okay, good luck, everyone. Um, okay, maybe we can move on to one of the next questions in the chat. Um, what are the benefits of getting a postdoc? Uh, it's, it's more time to publish, and when they're, you're, they're considering you for faculty jobs, they look at your publication record. Um, yeah, I would also say that um, nowadays um, postdocs are a must for even in getting to industry or um, trying to get an academic job. There, even now, there's people that do two postdocs and it's still kind of difficult for them to get a academic job. So um, that just gives you more experience. Um, like for me right now, I may be doing a PhD in organic synthesis. I'm leaning towards doing infectious disease or um, biology um, work for my postdoc. So it just um, widens up your um, area of interest and things that you've learned throughout your PhD program that you're interested in, but you don't have enough time to really, you know, study more or to get 
to do that type of science. Postdoc is um, what's going to help you to um, figure out what your research program that you want to develop someday and so forth. So for the postdoc, I feel like that's, uh, so everything is training, right? In graduate school, we're being trained to be independent scientists, but at the postdoc, you're really, you get even less independent, or you get, you get even more independent than you were in grad school because your advisor is still watching you during grad school to make sure that, you know, you're not going too far off the path where you're not being efficient with your time. Um, and so doing a postdoc will help you be more independent, more effective. And for academia, I would definitely say that, at least in biology, you pretty much need to do a postdoc because a lot of what I heard from other people that are more established is that they don't even care about your what you did during grad school that much compared to what you do during your postdoc. Because during your postdoc, you're supposed to be, you know, putting out publications that are of high quality, and that will really determine whether you're going to get a tenure position or not, tenure track position. Uh, for industry, you know, I, I kind of don't know. Uh, I would say that there are people that definitely do get into industry without postdocs. There's also postdocs that you do in industry that are a little bit shorter than what you would do in an academic postdoc. Um, so is that necessary? I'm not sure. Personally, I'm hoping not to have to do it, uh, but we'll see what the climate is like um, because you never really know until you're actually applying to get out there because at least from what I've seen, um, most people apply for their postdocs maybe like six months to a year before they're ready to actually go out uh, after their graduation. And so it's not, it's not immediate, but it's not too like they don't have to look a couple years earlier. Uh, so yeah, I think if you're planning on doing an alternative career, maybe a postdoc isn't necessarily necessary. Cool. Okay, so I think this will be uh, our last question and it's for Angela. Um, you're a fifth year candidate now. Um, what have you been doing or wish that you could have done more of uh, to better position you in industry, in the industry job market now that you're closer to getting your PhD? Uh, I would say that's a really hard question for me to answer right now because I don't know how I'm positioned currently. Uh, as I said, I don't think I'll know until I actually try to apply for jobs. There, in my lab, there are actually like three students ahead of me that want to go into industry. So I think they'll be, you know, connections for me and a better uh, predictor of how it will be when I go into the job market. Uh, but I am doing things as much as I can to get information because, you know, a big part of grad school is networking. And so a lot of the times it's the people that you know that help you later on. Um, and so, like I said, I'm doing that, planning on doing that internship in biotech. Um, that will give me a bit of experience there. And my program has different kinds of workshops on different careers where I can meet industry professionals and other people in academia. And those from even like regulatory agencies, science policy. So other types of careers. So I would say when you get into grad school to try to go to those types of workshops, um, surely they will be there at your program too. But also, you know, when you get into grad school, you're going to have all these things that are going to be require your immediate attention rather than focusing on what you're going to do five years from now. Um, and honestly, what you want to do might change. So you might go in wanting to initially go into industry and then you realize that you love uh, academia and you want to be a professor and have your own you know, lab. So just keep yourself open to whatever possibility it is at the end of the line because, you know, four or five years is a really long time and you don't have to hold yourself to what you thought when you went in. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's all the questions uh, that we have from the chat uh, for this afternoon. Um, but I want to extend a huge, huge uh, thank you to all of our speakers and presenters today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your very busy lives uh, to share your thoughts and insights and experiences with everyone. Um, all of the contact information for presenters are listed. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any other follow-up questions. Um, and again, we want to extend our, a huge, huge thank you um, from all of us at GMS API ASF. Um, Leangelo, anything else to add? No, just again, thank you everyone for um, staying the extra time to like really go in depth about this conversation. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, and if you have any uh, GMS specific questions in terms of how funding works, uh, you can feel free to email GMS at APIASF.org and we are happy to answer those questions for you as well. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.